Okay, so the reason that I bothered to review what happens when an alkene and an alkyne are treated with aqueous acid is because I want you to be able to clearly contrast and compare those reaction conditions with hydroboration oxidation. Now, as we discussed in our previous chapter, and I've just reminded you, if we take, once again, a regular alkene and treat it with aqueous acid, what ends up happening is we place an OH on the internal carbon, the one that would generate the more stable carbocation intermediate in the mechanism. Now, I brought this up in our last discussion. What if I wanted desperately to put the OH on the other position? rather than putting it on the internal carbon. Is there anything that I could do? Well, Markovnikov's rule would dictate under these conditions, the answer is no. Fortunately, there are other conditions that can yield that result. They are called hydroboration oxidation conditions. Thus, by a mechanism that I do not require you to know, you can take a simple alkene, treat it under these two steps, and place the OH in the anti-Markovnikov position. Now, one thing I want you to remember about hydroboration oxidation is that this is indeed a two-step reaction, so you should not forget to number the reagents. Step one is borane and THF, and step two is peroxide, hydroxide, and water. Now, what in the world happens if you treat an alkyne under similar conditions? When you treat an alkyne with aqueous acid and mercury sulfate, it ends up placing an OH in your product on the internal carbon, the one that would once again generate the more stable carbocation intermediate, which is completely analogous to what occurs when you do the same conditions to an alkene. This molecule is an enol. In particular, it's an enol that has the hydroxyl group attached to one of the two doubly bonded carbons. As I mentioned earlier, enols instantly tautomerize to form a ketone. Now I should point out that this arrow on the top should actually be larger than the arrow on the bottom because although these go back and forth, the keto form is much more stable and exists much more prevalently than the enol form. Now, what if I take an alkyne and I treat it under hydroboration oxidation conditions? Well, as occurs with alkenes, if I take an alkyne and I treat it under the same hydroboration oxidation conditions, what forms is an enol where the OH is put on the external carbon in the original carbon-carbon triple bond. In other words, I've just generated the analogous anti-Markovnikov product. As with the reaction we just showed up here, this enol instantly tautomerizes to form this compound, which is called an aldehyde. An aldehyde is different from a ketone because an aldehyde has a hydrogen coming off of one side of the carbon that's doubly bonded to an oxygen. Once again, these equilibrium arrows should show a larger arrow on top than on the bottom, indicating that the equilibrium strongly favors the product aldehyde. So this is what happens in the hydroboration oxidation alkyne, and I hope that you can clearly see how that compares and how it is analogous to the hydroboration oxidation of an alkene. As with our alkene discussion, you should not forget to number the reagents in hydroboration oxidation. This is a two-step reaction. So to recap, once again, if I take an alkyne and treat it with water, acid, and mercury sulfate, I will generate an enol that has the hydroxyl group on the internal carbon, the one that would have the more stable carbocation, which instantly tautomerizes to form a ketone. In contrast, if I treat the same alkyne under hydroboration oxidation conditions, the OH ends up going on the external carbon, which also instantly tautomerizes to form this product, which is called an aldehyde. We now return to a subject that I talked about in our last chapter's lecture, the hydrogenation of alkenes. As we discussed before, if you take an alkene and treat it with hydrogen gas, H2, and one of these four transition metal catalysts, palladium, platinum, rhodium, or nickel, what occurs is it converts the alkene into an alkane by placing these two hydrogens on the same face as each other. That is, they go cis to each other, as pointed out here. So you might be wondering, what happens if I hydrogenate an alkyne? If I take an alkyne and treat it with hydrogen gas and any of the same metal catalysts, it actually converts the alkyne all the way down to the alkane by adding two equivalents of H2 to this triple bond. In other words, under these conditions, there's no way to stop at the alkene. But what if I want to stop at the alkene? Is there any way that I can take this alkyne and just add two hydrogens onto it, converting it to an alkene, and have it stop reacting? 
As it turns out, there is. If you take an alkyne and treat it with hydrogen gas and a special catalyst called Lindler catalyst, which is a less reactive form of palladium, it will add the two hydrogens cis to each other and stop at the alkene, giving you a Z alkene as shown here. That is once again summarized in this figure. I take my alkyne, hit it with hydrogen gas and Lindler's catalyst. I can place two individual hydrogens on this carbon-carbon triple, reducing it down to a carbon-carbon double. The two appendages in the original alkyne always end up being Z to each other. Now you might be wondering, what if I don't want a Z alkene? What if I want to take my alkyne and I want to turn it into an E alkene? Is there anything I can do there? Well, as it turns out, there is. If you take your alkyne and treat it under these conditions, sodium or lithium and liquid ammonia at negative 78, you can actually put two individual hydrogen atoms on this carbon-carbon triple bond and give yourself the E configuration giving you an E alkene. These conditions stop there. So these are two different ways of taking an alkyne and converting it into an alkene rather than going all the way to an alkane, which is what would occur under traditional hydrogenation conditions. For this second reaction, I should point out that I do not require you to know the mechanism of it. If you want to learn it, however, it is found in your text. And now to a different subject, acidity of alkynes. Now one thing that I want to point out is that carbon atoms' individual levels of electronegativity actually vary depending upon their hybridization. This is something that I want you to memorize. SP hybridized carbons are more electronegative than SP2 hybridized carbons, which are more electronegative than SP3 hybridized carbons. Now you might be wondering why in the world is that the case? Well, an sp orbital is 50% s and 50% p. An sp2 orbital is one third s and two thirds p, while an sp3 orbital is 25% s and 75% p. Why in the world do we care? Well, as it turns out, s orbitals are closer to the nucleus of the atom and are hence closer to the protons found in that nucleus. Hence, if you have an orbital that's sp, in other words, it's made 50% of an s orbital and 50% of a p orbital, it has more s character, which means that it is closer to the nucleus of the carbon atom and closer to the protons. What in the world does that mean? It means that the electrons are going to be sucked more tightly than they would in an sp2 or an sp3 orbital. That ultimately means, once again, that an sp hybridized carbon atom is more electronegative, that is, it sucks electrons towards itself more, than an sp2 hybridized carbon, which is more electronegative than an sp3 hybridized carbon. Now this prompts me to remind you of something I taught you back in chapter one, where you might remember me talking to you about something called a pKa value, which are numbers that are used to reflect a compound's acidity. You might also remember me telling you that the lower the pKa value of an acidic proton, the more acidic that proton is. With that said, I'm now going to show you the relative pKa values of alkynes versus alkenes versus alkanes. As you can see here, alkynes have pKa values of about 25. What that means is that these protons here and here, which are bonded to the sp hybridized carbons in this alkyne, are somewhat acidic. By comparison, the protons bonded to the sp2 hybridized carbons in an alkene have pKa values of 44. Protons that are bonded to sp3 hybridized carbons, as in alkenes, have pKa values above 60. What in the world does that mean? Well, once again, this means that the protons which are bonded to the sp hybridized carbons in an alkyne are about 10 raised to the 20th power times more acidic than the protons that are bonded to the sp2 hybridized carbons in an alkene, which are in turn about 10 to the 20th power times more acidic than the protons that are bonded to the sp3 hybridized carbons in an alkane. What in the world do these numbers really mean? Well, looking at an alkane, for example, if I have a pKa value of about 60, 
What that means is that if you had 10 raised to the 60th power molecules of an alkane, now you can imagine how large that number is. That's, that's 10 with 59 zeros after it. That's a very, very huge number. If you had that many molecules of that alkane, one of those molecules in solution would be deprotonated. That's how unacidic an alkane is. By comparison, once again, an alkene is about 10 to the 20th times more acidic, and an alkyne is 10 to the 20th times more acidic than that. Now, why in the world do we care? Well, as it turns out, because an alkyne has that level of reasonable acidity, we can do cool reactions to it. If I have an alkyne, for example, whose acidic terminal proton has been removed and replaced with a negative charge, I can react that terminal negatively charged alkyne with an alkyl halide, such as this alkyl bromide, and increase the length of that alkyne. Here's the mechanism by which that proceeds. The now lone pair electrons on this fsp hybridized carbon left over when that carbon's hydrogen was removed come in and attack this carbon right here. When they attack this carbon here, it forms a bond between the carbon in the alkyne and the carbon located here. As these electrons come in and attack this carbon to form that bond, the two electrons being shared by this carbon and this bromine get pushed into the bromine and release it as free bromide. This thereby extends the length of this alkyne to be that shown here. So yes, we can add carbons to the end of a terminal alkyne by removing its proton and then stirring it in the presence of an alkyl halide, like an alkyl bromide or an alkyl chloride or an alkyl iodide. This process is called the alkylation of alkynes. Now just so you know, the word alkylation just means adding an alkyl group to something. And an alkyl group is basically a hydrocarbon chain, a chain of carbons and hydrogens. So you can see I can start with a boring terminal alkyne, hit it with a base that removes its acidic proton, and then the resulting negative charge can then be allowed to attack an alkyl bromide to thereby extend the chain and give me a lengthened overall alkyne. Once again, this process is called alkylation. So I hasten to mention that the base that's usually used to remove the hydrogen attached to this sp hybridized carbon on a terminal alkyne is a base that's called sodium amide or sodamide, whose formula is NaNH2.